Welcome everyone. Uh, we are very happy to welcome you today to the second event of the series of online lectures and workshops when museums meet video games. And today's session is uh, called When Cultural Institutions Become Video Game Producers. I am Maxime Laprad. I have been working on this program with a, an amazing team, including Diane Drubet, Emma Butin, uh, Denis Kennel, Laura Baud, among other people. This program is presented to you by the cultural services of the French Embassy via the Villa Albertine a new cultural institution reinventing artist residencing residencies across the United States. It is also organized by We Are Museums, a community of museum change makers, leading museums through change. I invite you to visit the online community of We Are Museums. And it has been developed in cooperation with the Smithsonian, which contributed to build a rich program by giving thoughts and precious insights into the topics that we will cover together. I am pleased to now give the mic to Denis Kennel from the French Embassy in the United States, who will tell you a little bit more about Villa Albertine. Denis, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Maxime, uh, and uh, good uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy uh, to be with you today for this uh, second event of the series of uh, lectures and uh, workshops on museums and uh, and video games. So, the, the, as Maxime said, this program is an initiative from uh, Villa Albertine, which is a new French institution for arts and ideas uh, that has been launched in the U.S. just one month ago. Uh, so with a permanent presence in 10 uh, major U.S. cities, including uh, D.C., uh, it aims to foster in-depth exploratory residencies for artists, thinkers, and cultural professionals from all creative disciplines. Villa Albertine will also actively support the endeavors of French cultural actors uh, across the country and uh, will also offer professional programs that cover key cultural fields and uh, creative industries. So more specifically in DC, Villa Albertine will explore uh, some of the most significant contemporary challenges faced by cultural institutions and especially museums in our societies when they try to reinvent themselves to attract a broader and a more diversified audience. So this series of lectures and the workshops workshops uh, per perfectly fits this uh, this framework. Uh, if you would like to get more information about the Villa Albertine and especially the, the call for application for 60 exploration residencies in the United States in 2023 that we, we just launched, uh, please uh, check our website uh, www.villa-albertine.org. Uh, 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 thanks for being here and uh, have a great lecture and, uh, and workshop. very much, uh, Denis. Um, so to introduce today, uh, with the Museum Lab, when museums meet video games, we hope to foster more collaborations between museums and video game studios by providing a safe environment conducive to honest and impactful discussions. Each of these sessions are divided into two parts. The first part, right now, is a public lecture hosted by a key thinker and leader in the industry. And then we have intervention, intervention by two or three speakers. The second part is a collaborative workshop tapping into the potential of collective intelligence to map resources and solutions. This second part is upon registration only, so book your ticket for the next one ASAP on our event rate bright pages. Today, Christian Volsing is going to host uh, the public session. Christian is a curator of contemporary design and popular culture. Working at the Victoria and Albert Museum since two 2007, he is currently part of a team forming Young VNA in East London a museum to engage children and young people with the possibilities of creativity and design in all its forms. He has previously contributed to the VNA, VNA's Rapid Response Collecting Project, co-curated the groundbreaking 2018 exhibition Video Games Design Play Disrupt, and the museum's 2020 Global Collecting Project and Display All Will Be Well, Children's Rainbow from the Pandemic. Christian, you now have the mic. Hello, uh, welcome to the second session of the Museums Meet Video Games program, where we'll shortly be hearing from two practitioners in the field, the George Eastman Foundation's Kate Myers Emery and Playmatics Nick Fortuno. I just want to talk a bit about my own experience in working with video games in the museums first. And that really began in earnest with co curating the VNA's groundbreaking exhibition, Contemporary Video Game Design and Culture, Design Play Disrupt, which you can see an image of here, the first gallery, which was sadly curtailed from an international tour by the global pandemic. Uh, but it, and uh, 
I also co-authored and edited the accompanying book. And this was the first time a major national institution had really delved into and exhibited front and centre the inspirations and process material that make up the production of today's video games from both blockbuster studios and small independent individuals designing in their bedrooms. With a whole gallery showcasing the expansion of personal and political themes and subjects that designers are exploring through video games today and the culture of player contributions to game design following their public release from fan art to spectacular constructions in Minecraft to esports tournaments and DIY grassroots game curation events. Through expanding the museum's engagement in video games is one of the most important design mediums today. I've since joined a team developing Young DNA, an outpost of the Victoria and Albert Museum in East London, which will open in 2023, that aims to engage children and young people from babies to 14 year olds with art, design and performance. And this image is a render from the Future Games Gallery, which will introduce our older visitors to the game design process from mechanics to aesthetics and narratives, another first in the UK as a permanent gallery on game design, both board and digital. Both of these projects have led to my engagement with game designers and pra practitioners in industry and through cultural institutions. However, I haven't yet had the opportunity to combine game design with narrative building for museums. And this is a challenge that museum professionals now are ascending to in the 21st century, as we grapple with the pervasive technologies that surround us in contemporary society. Acknowledging that museums need to transform exhibition practice and audience experience, the second session of the Museums Meet Video Games programme will dive into groundbreaking examples where museums have used video game production to explore new ways of engaging with audiences and interactions both on-site and off. First up, I'd like to introduce Nick Fortuno, interactive narrative and game designer based in New York City. Nick is a founder and principal of Playmatics, an interactive development company that has created a variety of digital and real world experiences for organizations, including Disney, the American Museum of Natural History, the Red Cross and Red Crescent, and many others. A designer, writer, and project manager on dozens of co commercial and serious games, Fortuna has served as a lead designer on a blockbuster, Dyna Dash, and the award-winning serious game, IET, The Cost of Life. He is also a co-founder of the Come Out and Play Street Games Festival hosted in New York City and Amsterdam since 2006 and is an assistant professor and program director of the Digital Game Design Program at Long Island University, having taught game design for 15 years at institutions such as Columbia and Parsons School of Design. So uh, just a reminder that if you have any questions, please add them to the chat as we will have a short Q&A after both speakers, but following that imposing resume, I'm very happy to pass over to Nick to tell us more about his experience. Uh, thank you. And uh, just my apologies for not being on camera right now. I'm having technical difficulties here. But uh, yes, yeah, so I, I, at Playmatics, um, we've done a lot of work with museums. And uh, uh, I'm going to speak about the American Museum of Natural History project, one of, the, one of the projects we do with the American Museum of Natural History. But I've also worked with Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, the New York Public Library, the um, Holocaust Museum in, in the Smithsonian. And so I have a lot of experience sort of thinking about how games can get used in these contexts. And the one game I want to talk about today is a game called Micro Rangers, which we built for the Museum of Natural History in 2015. Um, that was a, a good case study, I think, in sort of how to think about how games can intersect with museum content. So uh, Micro Rangers uh, uh, it essentially was an AR experience that was built for the museum as a way of repurposing a lot of the content in the museum spaces. Uh, it involved a series of coins that you got when you came into the museum that you would scan, uh, and then you would go to different exhibits to, in, to engage in a game that used AR assets to sort of tell you a story. Um, the, the first thing that I think was important about this project is that it, it's a, it, these kinds of projects are massive collaborations, right? So uh, in this project, we worked with a number of different people at the museum, um, and all of them were critical to what went on, which led from people like Barry Joseph and Hannah Jarris, who were kind of like the producers on the new media education side and thinking about the larger projects of new media at the museum. Uh, Dr. Susan Perkins, who was our subject matter expert who worked specifically with uh, the kinds of content we were working with, which I'll get to in a moment. But then also because the American Museum of Natural History is a teaching institution, we were working with classrooms. And so we needed science instructors to be part of the project too. Um, and on, then on top of that, you had the development team, which included people like Jer Jeremy Kinski, who did the AR development for us, and Carl Farah, who was a game design intern. So uh, one of the top lessons I want to just kind of impart is that um, any project that's like a game for impact, but particularly with an institution, is, is a collaboration between many, many different partnerships. And the game developers on the project 
are bringing an expertise that should supplement the expertises in the museum. Like we, we don't parachute in, right? We work very closely in collaboration with the people who are there. Um, uh, the second point is that uh, the early parts of the project and several months of the beginning of the project were really um, organized around figuring out what goals the project had, right? And so in Micro Rangers, before we had any sense we were going to do any, any AR and before we had any sense of what the game development was, there was a discussion within the museum about what the game could do for the museum. And essentially that boiled down to three things. Uh, Susan Perkins works with invertebrate animals and was interested in teaching people about how microorganisms affected ecosystems. Um, and there was a drive in the museum at the time to look at sort of ecosystems as a, as a learning goal. Uh, and the museum doesn't actually feature ecosystems very well because its methodology and its, in its, its exhibitions was based in an earlier era where, where you weren't thinking as much about that. So the goal was to see how those exhibitions, exhibitions of mammals or insects or plant life related to microorganism cultures, and also to demonstrate how humans were part of those ecosystems, right? Like, so what do human beings have to do with that? And in an era of climate change and potentially six extinction, these are really critical questions for any scientific institution. And then finally, um, a lot of the exhibits we were talking about were less visited parts of the museum. So the goal was to see if a game could move people to parts of the museum that they didn't normally um, visit. And so what we built together was an AR game that guided users through the museum to solve crises, right? Like crises that were um, basically caused by problems in the microorganism world. And so as users wandered through the museum on quests, they would zoom into exhibits. Uh, and this is what you see in the image here. Like I see a panorama of this of this mammal, and then I zoom into the that panorama to see how the microorganism uh, ba balance is out of whack, and then how solving that microorganism out uh, imbalance could lead to a fix in the macro world, right? Um, and so the the essential idea behind the game is that you walked from exhibit to exhibit, uh, scanning things. And then playing mini games so that you could see a science around how microorganisms might operate in a real world crisis. Um, the third point is that because it was a teaching institution, we worked a lot with students. So the game was developed in parallel with classrooms of students who were learning about the science and helping us work on the game content. And this is something that Barry Joseph and I worked on several times at the museum. And it's a nice vantage point to think about how a museum can work with a game producer. It doesn't just have to be that the game is built for the museum. The game can be a vehicle for education in the museum, like working with communities or working with students who come into the museum uh, to help build the game. And in this case, uh, students took the role of researchers. They wrote on the game. And actually, the picture you see here is that the students actually served as actors in the AR experience. So you can actually see students who are in the program in the AR game when you play the game uh, delivering content. Uh, the center of the game was that uh, different uh, ex ex exhibition halls and uh, exhibits in those halls uh, had crises and the player who walked into the museum and just asked to sign up for the game was given a coin to activate the game and told that they were a micro ranger, right? Uh, and that they'd have to go to different stations to solve problems, right? And all of the circles you see on the lower right, these are all prototyping materials we did when we were doing a board game version of this game. These are all exhibitions in specific halls. So you can see the halls of forests, halls of oceans, halls of mammals, and then a bunch of different exhibitions that can have crises at them. And the circles represent the degree of, of, uh, of uh, severity of the crisis. And the idea is that the player, by navigating a map, has to go to those crises and solve them. This was directly inspired by the board game Pandemic. Um, and I think that's like the third lesson I want to talk about is that um, just because these games are educational or serious doesn't mean we're not relying on commercial games to understand how they work. And so Pandemic was the inspiration for this game in a, in a very literal sense. Once they arrived at a hall, um, they basically played an AR mini game. They would scan the exhibit by finding something that the AR could pick up that we had pre-planned. And then they would zoom into a, an AR micro game experience where they would manipulate microorganisms. So they'd be told like, oh, we discovered the problem. The problem is that the, that the pH in the water is too high and we have to lower it to be able to have the microorganisms thrive. And then they would play a little mini game. The inspiration for this was uh, very young children's games like Toka Boca. Um, the idea was that this was a family approachable game. So we wanted to make it uh, something that people could play very easily. And that's like kind of a fourth lesson here is that um, this is always, game design is always about listening to audience. And in this case, we knew that this would be families. That's the primary uh, attendee of the Museum of Natural, American Museum of Natural History. So we built games that would be possible for them to play. 
Uh, and that, that meant simple, that meant approachable, that meant fast. Um, over the course of its life, it, it, the micro range was up for about two years in the American Museum of Natural History before changes to their application led to the sunsetting of the game. It was available in, in both the iOS and Android uh, Play stores. Uh, over its two years, it saw tens of thousands of users, maybe low hundreds of thousands of users. Um, and our early reporting kind of pointed out some of the value of it. So this was like, like what you're looking at here is like early survey results from how the game worked. Um, and what we saw was like enormous response to the game from the early test group, which was random users at the museum, right? These were just people we approached randomly about how much like this led them to want to uh, like spend time at the museum experiencing things like this. Uh, and so this was a promising project for the museum. And even though it sunsetted for complex reasons, I am happy to discuss their public. Uh, like we, we saw that this led to an influx of more game-like activities into the museum because attendees seemed to want it. And so approaches like this were interesting for the museum because it meant that people could learn in new ways. Uh, and interestingly, even continue research on their own uh, after the fact. Um, so this is one example of a game uh, in a museum, like a specific example, but I liked highlighting this one because it really points out a lot of the pieces of the process, a sort of like baseline iterative process of paper prototyping that's inspired by game development, a focus on design goals uh, that, that inform the project and the importance of establishing those design goals up front. And then finally, the deep partnerships that are necessary to build a game of this sort. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this. Uh, well, thank you, Nick, for um, that amazing introduction to your work. Uh, I really love the idea that you can be guided to hidden parts of the museum because I work in a museum that apparently has over seven miles of galleries, so I can see how that's really important. Um, our next speaker is Kate Myers-Emery, Manager of Digital Engagement at the George Eastman Museum. Kate is an anthropologist dedicated to public engagement, education and outreach, both online and in person, and to sharing cultural heritage and history. Okay. And she is a researcher and educator with over, with over 10 years of experience leveraging digital platforms to engage and educate the public. And in her role at the George Eastman Museum, she uses digital methods to find ways to engage the public and museum collections, from video games and virtual tours to educational videos and social media. Um, without any further delay, I will now hand you over to Kate. Thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to be talking about a very different type of project. So um, I'm gonna be talking about a game that we created called Film Quest. And we did this in basically three days um, with under a hundred dollars. Um, so this is the opposite of like, if you need to take the scrappy approach to video game production, uh, what does that look like? So in 2017, the Eastman Museum was opening an exhibition about a collection of films that were um, from India. And as people started talking about the narrative behind how we got this collection, it hit me that this just felt like a video game. Uh, so the story went like this. In 2013, our collections manager got a phone call saying, hey, we've got this theater in California. It is full of films and posters from India, primarily Bollywood, but other regional styles as well. Um, if you want the films and posters, you can come get them before the theater is demolished. So the team arrived to collect all these films and it turned out that they only had three days to do it. The demolition team was coming a lot sooner than they thought. Um, and so that's the, the first kind of game element that appeared. There was this ticking clock. There wasn't unlimited time, it was three days. Um, as they started going into the theater and gathering films, they discovered that portions of the building no longer had electricity. Um, so they'd need to find the objects in the dark using flashlights. Um, and the objects were also scattered across the building. They weren't in a vault somewhere. They were you know, tucked in different hidden places. They were in projection rooms. They were kind of scattered throughout the theater. So this made for really interesting environmental factors that would also be really good for a game. Uh, finally, they were told that there were probably dozens of films that they could come collect, but it turned out that there were hundreds. Um, there might even be, been thousands. So all of a sudden they had to make a lot of decisions on the fly about 
what were they going to keep? They knew they couldn't keep everything. They couldn't get everything out of the building. They didn't even have the truck space for it. Um, so they really had to make these on the fly decisions. So another good game element. So despite never having actually made a video game, I decided that I would take on this project because it just seemed like it was too good of an opportunity to actually pass up. Um, so we started with learning goals. Um, I come from an education background and I really wanted to make sure that this was going to be worthwhile. And I think this is a really important step. Um, games can become something that's just kind of shiny and neat but you really do want to make sure that they actually are going to serve the exhibition and they are going to um, work well with what you're trying to accomplish overall. Um, so we wanted to make sure that players would gain an appreciation for the circumstances under which the collection was rescued. We wanted players to understand the decisions that were being made about what was rescued and what was left behind. Um, and we wanted to have that good mix of fun and education. We didn't want to go so far into being educational that people wouldn't want to play it. So we wanted to make something that um, felt fun, it felt quirky, it felt exciting. So we had some basic decisions that we talked through at the beginning. Um, so what type of game was this going to be? We decided to do something that was like a retro RPG. Um, I was really thinking about like Super Nintendo Legend of Zelda as a template when we were making this. The audience that we were hoping to attract to play this game was more of like a Gen Y, Millennial, Gen X audience. So we picked something that had this like retro nostalgic feel to it. Um, also, it's that's just an easier game to make. <laughs> um, we'd have to use a lot more complicated technology to make a game that felt, you know, like like a Call of Duty style game or something that's really modern. So doing something retro also had that benefit. Um, we wanted players to be able to access it in the gallery as a bonus. We wanted them to be able to access it online, but that was kind of a secondary um, goal. In terms of content or assets, because we didn't have anything previously and we've never attempted this, we were very much starting from scratch. So there was nothing that we were going to be able to reuse. Um, Although now if we want to create a game, we do have kind of that baseline. Um, who can help? I think this is a big thing. Um, so I came into this with a little bit of an edge, which was, well, I hadn't programmed a game before. I did serve as a project manager for an educational video game. Um, so I knew what the process was supposed to look like. I knew what went into it. I knew what we had to consider. Um, I'm also a gamer myself. So I, I play games in my spare time. I understand kind of the elements that they need. Um, also at the time, my cousin was in um, art school and was focusing on video game art. So I knew like I could leverage her and I could get her to make me some pretty cool assets. Um, and timeline and budget. The timeline we had was about a month and the budget was no budget. Um, so we, we were kind of able to like scrape together just enough to do it. Um, but yeah, we, we really had a limited time and almost no money. Um, so the first thing that we did was just think about, you know, what was this going to look like? How many different elements, how many different pages did we need? So we knew that we had to have a main screen that introduced what this was. We knew that we had to have some type of cutscene that's introducing and setting it up. So telling you this story about you know, the collections manager getting this phone call and having to go to the theater and that you were going to need to be the collections manager and collect these films. From there, we wanted to have three different levels so that this was, it's a short game. I mean, you can probably play the whole thing in under five minutes. And we wanted it to be something that, you know, in the gallery, lots of people could play it. It wouldn't take up too much time. So they're very short levels um, and the levels vary just a little bit. So they're different spaces in the theater. From there, at the end, you get a score of how much were you able to collect, what different types of films and posters did you get, and then we shared the credits and the copyright. So it's a very a simple, simple game. <laughs> um, from there, it's just kind of taking the same thing and just adding more detail. So you know, we figured out, you know, what is the map going to look like? What is the level going to look like? What characters do we need? What sounds? Um, and can we reuse them? A lot of what we did was just creating one element and then coloring it different things. 
so that we could reuse it just to keep things super, super simple. Um, the only thing that was complicated was creating the character, which is why it was super helpful to have my cousin who thinks about these things and knows how to do this. Um, honestly, like getting her hair to swing back and forth as she was walking kind of blew my mind. Um, yeah, this is this is what the character actually looks like when it she's pulled apart into the different pieces. Um, so yeah, we kind of fleshed out, you know, this is what it's going to look like. This is this world. We also made sure that the colors in the game match the colors that were in the gallery. So we tried to keep everything really consistent. For actually creating the game, we decided to use a platform called Construct 3. So this has an educational license to it. It's really good pricing. Um, super, super easy to use. Very easy to export in different styles. And it has lots of great instructional videos and tutorials, which was important here of that it was something like I needed to learn how to do this whole thing. So I needed a tool that was basically going to teach me how to use it. Um, I will say, having gone through this process, it is helpful if you have, if you're a gamer, if you have gaming experience, just so that you kind of understand what is supposed to be happening and what elements you need. Um, for using Construct, it can also be helpful if you have some SQL query experience. You don't need to actually know how to like use SQL or anything like that, but the way that the programming in Construct works is fairly similar, so it, it can be helpful. I think also, you know, if you know how to do like JavaScript, it has a feel to that, even though it's much, much more simplified. Um, so once we picked the tool and we came up with all the stuff, we started building it. I took, I took basically a two and a half days off of like my normal job to do this. And so I spent a half day training and I just did every tutorial I possibly could. And then I took two days to just build the game. I had everything I needed and just put it all together. And then we spent probably about a half day of time testing over the course of a month. So this was me sending out examples to friends and family, different people across the museum, and they would send me feedback and I would tweak things a little bit. And um, yeah, and then probably it was one day of hired help from my cousin to get her to create characters, objects, and obstacles for the game. So now I'm going to just show you what the game actually ended up looking like. So we've got our instructions, a cutscene. And so this is basically it. Of it is just our little character called Deb wandering through different parts of movie theaters and trying to find film reels and posters. Um, all in dark, all with her little flashlight. So in general, it's, oops. Oh, let's see if I can get it out. Oh, um, so very simple game, um, but very effective. We had a lot of really good feedback. Um, we ended up having a lot of like kids that would just hang outside the gallery while their parents went in and they would just play the game over and over. Um, so this is what it looked like actually on site. It was just on a computer and people could play through it. It also is available still on our website. So if you want to try playing it, it's at eastman.org slash film quest. Um, and yeah, this was a super fun thing that we got to do. We have created some games since then, but this is still like our favorite. Um, and it's definitely something like any museum can take this on and do this type of project. Um, if anyone is interested in actually like doing this and replicating it for their museum, I'm happy to send them all of the documentation and um, chat through how this process went. So thank you so much. Uh Thank you, Kate, for that insight into an exciting moment in the Eastern Museum's collection history and how you translated that into a simple game that really engages visitors from museum practice. 
and making it sound so easy. And it definitely makes me want to have a go now as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, just now we have um, a few minutes lined up for questions from the audience. Um, so uh, just to start off, we, um, so uh, question for uh, Nick, um, what would be the uh, main thing for museum professionals to know before going into collaborating, into collaboration with a video game studio? Do, and that's going to be your expertise, right? But that even if you've made games before, probably the game developer knows more about game development than you do. So you should let them lead that part of the process. Uh, and then when that happens in a natural way and everyone has a mutual respect, then the project really goes quite smoothly because because there's a there's a, a, a there's a there's a leaning into the expertise that makes things move in a proper way. Um, the second thing is, uh, and, I, and I'm glad that that all of us have been saying this because it's like I think it is actually the most important point. And I, I heard it I heard it in the discussion. You know, like film class, it was like right at the top too. Um, you really need to know what the intention of the project is. Like, what are the objectives of the project? This is like this is a general point about I think games for impact, but I think it, it applies here equally well, which is that. If you don't, at the very beginning, really clearly establish what the learning objectives are or what the objectives of the project are, there are two dangers that can come up. The first is the one that was mentioned, which is that, oh, a game is shiny and fun, and then you just chase fun, and then nobody learns anything, but you made something cool, which is sort of off topic, right? And then the second problem is that um, if, when games start getting developed, they go through an iterative process. That's just sort of hatch naturally how they work. Um, and so you'll start experimenting and changing things. And if you don't know what the objectives are, it's very easy for everyone to get distracted by something and then go down a bad road, right? Like, oh, this was a game about teaching about climate and we're going to really focus on sea level rise. But, you know, we should also teach about storms and boy, storms would fit really well in here. And now we get all the storm content in. But if we have the storm content, don't we have to talk about rising temperature content? And then suddenly the game got five times bigger, right? Um, whereas if you design the goals up front and you say like, this is about sea level rise, it gives everyone a, 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 a mile, like a, like a lighthouse to look at and say, right, okay, we have to stay focused. And particularly when, when you're talking about games that are, that are under smaller budgets or smaller time constraints, this can be the difference between the game succeeding or failing. So I would say if you're an institution looking at, at like working with a game designer, probably the best thing you could do before we're contracting a developer is very explicitly lay out what the objectives of the project are, right? So when the developer comes on board, there's a clear roadmap of what both needs to be accomplished and how the games will be judged uh, in terms of whether it's successful or not. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting uh, link that you, you come across quite a lot when you're building narratives in museums as well, that actually there are many branches that you can go down when you're trying to tell one story. And if you don't um, stick to that, then, you know, everything gets very murky. So I think it's a it's a really uh, important point. Um, I've got a question, I think, for Kate here uh, from Game in Society. They have asked, uh, I was wondering if you thought of this kind of top-down RPG as uh, as an online visit so you know playing the game outside of the museum is that equivalent to like visiting the collection i think is what they're asking yeah i guess that's um i think that's a challenge just for museums in general right now is defining what like a visit is and what counts and um yeah we we tend to just consider them separately of virtual visitors versus not but i do we do notice when we look at like the analytics of people playing us on our website that they don't then just leave the website they then get interested they explore a little more they engage with things um so it does seem like having the game is kind of the the shiny beginning to your museum adventure um i'm totally okay with this just being like that's the door that gets somebody in who wouldn't have normally been interested in the museum 
Um, and I think you, so you had it, so people could play um, outside of the museum, but also inside the museum and that also engaged visitors, right? Yes. Yeah. I think in both cases, um, we had it outside of the gallery. So when you were walking up to the gallery, um, you would see the, the video game actually yeah. first before you enter the gallery doors. Um, and so for some people who might have skipped the gallery, it was um, kind of a fun entrance, so very similar thing of it. It drew some people in who might not have been interested in like Bollywood films off the bat. I think hearing that there is more to it than that, that there's kind of this adventure story along with it and actually getting to play through it was really helpful in getting some people through those doors. Um, another question for you, Kay, also, um, if you had the opportunity today to develop the game again, uh, would you go about it the same way or do you think you'd be collaborating with an external partner? Um, so we actually, when I first had the idea, I did reach out to a game studio to get help with this. Um, we are lucky that locally um, the Rochester Institute of Technology has a gaming center where they have students that help produce games and so it's a little bit cheaper but it's kind of these fun collaborations and that was where i went first um but with the timeline that we had and the fact that we had zero budget for it um you know going back again if we had more time to plan it and we did have more of a budget i think it would have been fun to build it out a little bit more but i actually think this was pretty effective I mean, we, we were trying to do something very simple. And so having a simple game like this, it worked out well. Um, we are looking to do some games for a gallery that is opening in 2024. And for that, we're going to be reaching out to um, potentially the, the Magic Studio at the Rochester Institute of Technology and some other people, because it is, we're going to make them a little bit nicer looking and um, a little bit more complicated. Well, that's exciting. Um, so uh, thank you very much both for um, for taking part today, uh, Kate and Nick. Um, it was really great to talk to you and for, for you to, to share your insight and experience. And also for Maxime and We Are Museums for arranging this event today. And so um, I'd now like to hand you back to Maxime. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Christian. Uh, thank you very much for, thank you, Kate and Nick, too, for this intervention and for uh, the Q&A at the end. Uh, we are coming to the conclusion of this event of uh, when museum, museums meet video games. Uh, so with the, with the Villa Albertine, the French Embassy in the United States, the Smithsonian and We Are Museums, I am thanking you for attending this event. Uh, thank you for joining today. Uh, we have our third event, Video Games, A Door to New and Diverse Audiences, on the 9th of December. Don't miss it. We have even bright pages. You can uh, save, uh, save it. You can uh, subscribe to it and get a ticket. Um, and for the one who are joining us on the workshop, for the workshop, I will meet you on Zoom right away. See you next time, everybody. Thank you again.